Hello. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today is Tuesday, and today we're going to speak about. Uh, yes, Taji, question? Hi, this is Joanna with Career Status. Oh, I think she's. Um... No, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, all right. So she's really now. Okay, all right. Uh, let's start again. Okay, so today is Tuesday, April the 26th. Today we're going to talk about uh, more about contracts, uh, specifically about rent back. Okay, as I said before, uh, with regards to rent back, you know, I don't suggest giving free rent back. Okay, what do I mean by that? You know, when you say free rent back, that means they're paying nothing, right? My suggestion is the way you would charge a seller for staying after closing is you charge them a fee, let's say $100 per day, right? Now, <clears throat> if they happen to overstay, at least you've, de you've determined what the daily rate is, okay? Now, the way I teach you guys to do it is charge the daily rate of $100 for the next 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is. If the seller moves out on time by a certain date, buyer agrees to waive the rent back fee. Okay, so that's how you, it would become free or not necessarily free, but no charge to the seller. Because as you know, nothing is ever free, right? Uh, the buyer is paying for that, for that mortgage, for that interest during that time. So again, you know, they're paying for insurance, right? Maybe for maintenance, I don't know. So again, nothing is ever free. So, you know, when people say, oh, free rent back, don't treat it as free rent back. Treat it as regular rent for staying after closing. And if they, if they move out by a certain time, then they have uh, incentive to move out on time, then the buyer can agree to waive it, okay? So the language on the, on the form itself is, you know, if seller moves out, you know, within 30 days after close of escrow, buyer agrees to waive the rent, the daily rent back fee, right? Um, so again, there's different things that I'm going to share with you guys that how you should handle it. Remember, everything is negotiable, right? Whatever you put in the contract, it's how it's going to flow. Okay. So again, the contract is the guide for all the terms um, that happens during the transaction. And sometimes the transaction goes past the close of escrow during the rent back period. So how does that work? So we'll give you some ideas and then I'll ask for some opinions and then some questions and then we'll move forward from there. Okay, so just to begin, right? I'm gonna share my, um, my screen here. Okay. You guys should see the disclosure of agency relationship. So I'm gonna go to the purchase contract, right? So tell me if you don't see the contract itself, right? So do you guys see the California Residential Purchase Agreement, right? You guys should yes, see the Yes, we can see it. <coughs> Thank you, Syed. All right. Yeah. So this is just a sample of it, right? So where do we see the rent back? Well, we see it on page um, two, right? The bottom of page two, okay? Where it says here, possession, right? So seller, you know, time of possession usually is upon recordation or, or 6 p.m., right? Uh, seller occupied, is it gonna be COE or there's a rent back? Remember, 29 days or less, you use the SIP, right? So you would put there whatever days it might be, right? If it's more than 30 days, then you would use the RLAS, the residential lease after agreement, okay? And it's said here on the right-hand side what those forms are. So let's look at those forms, right? So the SIP is a simpler form to complete, right? Uh, oops, wrong one. Uh, where's my dots? And my forms. Some of you guys have used this before, so please let me know if you have questions. Okay, so this is the first one. It's called the SIP. Right, seller's license. Um, okay, to remain in possession. Now they call it a license because you know that's there's some language in the law that that's how we have to call it. So this form came out. Used to be we used to use the same form, the RLAS. So this one's just a simple one pager, uh, two. You know, well, it's now two pager because of the signature line. Used to be just one pages. Right. So here's an example. It's very easy to complete. Right. So this is an addendum to the purchase agreement dated whenever you create that agreement, right? The property address, buyer, seller name, right? So number one, it says here the term, right? You guys see this, right? The term. So how many days, right? And until what time? Usually 
you know, you would put, you know, um, let's say 15 days and, you know, and it says here, you know, after, after close of escrow, right? Or is it a certain date? So usually this is a rolling calendar, right? So it's how many days after close of escrow. That's usually standard. You, I have here at 6 p.m. Now, if I usually try to change it to 11.59, right? Um, so that way, they, you know, that would be good, right? Basically, you have until midnight. But if I'm a buyer's agent, I'll leave it at 6 p.m. because I want to be able to get my buyer in there before I go to bed. But if I'm a seller, I usually try to get the seller until 11.59 to get in, to leave the house, okay? Again, everything is negotiable, okay? And you just have to play that by ear. Okay, so now in consideration, how much, right? I usually put a, a, a number of like $100 per day, right? So figure out what that daily rate is, right? Sometimes the house is paid off, right? The seller has no mortgage, so he doesn't want to pay any rent. But you still need to put a number there, okay? Just in case you have to sue the seller after the fact, okay? Um, now, of course, that money will be held in escrow, as it says here, okay? It's not going to be released to the buyer at closing. It's just going to be held in escrow. Once the seller moves out, we can instruct the escrow to say, hey, you know, um, release this much to the seller, this much to the buyer, okay? Um, it talks about, you know, late charges and all that. And of course, what is the obligation of the seller, right? This $5,000 here, this is like a security deposit, okay? Now they call it a delivery of possession fee, okay? But it's basically a, you know, it's it's a security deposit, okay? That's how what it acts as, okay? So basically if there's damage to the house or the sellers move out, there's this money left in escrow on top of the potential rent, okay? Now, you know, it's up to you guys to read the rest of this, okay? Um, it's pretty simple to read, okay? Now I have this language here, right? Seller to maintain their current homeowner insurance policy until they vacate the property. Rent back shall be one third of the buyer's PITI plus HOA dues per seller, occupies property after COE. Now this is just a sample, okay, that we created before. Seller must give minimum seven day notice to vacate prior to moving out. Buyer agrees to waive rent back fee if seller moves, you know, uh, moves out on time, okay? So, okay, in this case, buyer agrees to waive the rent back fee if seller moves out within 29 days or whatever. In this case, it's 15 days, right? So this is a sample language that we created uh, in a previous class. So you know, when you guys watch this uh, video on YouTube, you'll be able to see it again, but you know, you're welcome to look at it now. Again, if you have questions on how to write this, just let me know. But this is how we use our templates, right? Mm -hmm and creating our clauses, okay? This is how we use it. So after that, it's a pretty simple form, okay? So again, just look at it. Um, and if you have any questions, see, just like with any forms, I always teach you guys, or I ask you guys to fill it out for yourself. What if you're the buyer or the seller? How would you understand the form? Because this is part of your learning, right? This is how we learn. We learn by doing, right? Okay, so let's look at the other form now. Um, the RLAS, okay, the residential lease after sale that is supposed to be used for 30 days or longer, right? It's a similar form. The top part, again, it talks about, you know, um, the buyer seller name. And here it has here is a scheduled to occur, the closing date, right? Okay. So you just, this is just an estimate. Now this can change, right? What if your escrow uh, date changes? Then you need to update this form to have that date, okay? Now, here on the term, okay, it has a termination date. Unlike the SIP where it's a rolling 15 days, 29 days or whatever, okay, this one, it has to almost be exact, okay? So usually you'll have this done about a week, to two weeks before closing. Sometimes you can do one in the beginning when you go into escrow and then just adjust it if the dates do change, okay? So here you have to be more accurate on the dates uh, because it's not a rolling calendar, all right? Now, everything else, as far as, you know, payments and all that, right? It says here, you know, all the money will be held in escrow, basically is what number three says, you know. Um, all the rents are going to be held in escrow, including the security deposit. Similar to the other one, where it's called the licensing fee and a delivery fee, right? Here, we call it rent and also security deposit, okay? But basically, it's the same. Now this form is a little bit more lengthy because it it acts 
just like a rental agreement, okay? If you look at the residential lease agreement, um, you'll see it looks exactly the same for the most part. There's just a couple places that's different. So if you look at this, right, it's up to you to understand how to fill it out, okay? It's an easy form. You just have to fill out as you go, okay? Security deposit, right? It talks about you know, how it works, late charges, if any, right? Um, again, what is the purpose of the, these forms? In case that there's a dispute, there is something in writing that we can go back to to unravel the issues that there's, in, there's questions about, okay? Uh, here it talks about parking. The other one doesn't, right? Here it talks about storage, right? The other one doesn't. Here it talks about utilities, although the other one just basically says seller will maintain the property, you know, uh, while they occupy the property, okay? Um, there's these other forms here, okay? Um, so again, it's just a little more here. It talks about pets, smoking, right? So it acts just like a residential lease agreement. Okay. Uh, here it talks about, you know, if, if there's a condo, right. Um, talks about that, you know, what are the keys, things that you're going to give them. Okay. Again, all of these have been simplified in the SIP because that form is meant to be, like I said, single page, you know, even though it's two pages because of the signature line, it's more meant to just like, um, a simpler form, right? That's the shortcut of this form, okay? Like here on 18B, 10 acknowledged locks have been rekeyed or not. On the other one, it doesn't talk about rekeying, right? But on this residential lease after sale, it does talk about it, okay? Then also here, you know, there's talk about, um, you know, for sale signs and things like that, okay? It's just a little bit more lengthy, okay? Uh, because after 30 days, this is why in some hotels, they don't allow you to stay more than 30 days. They will check you out on the 29th day and they will move you into another room, okay? Um, because that's the way they do it, okay? Um, in some hotels, they'll allow you to stay in the same room, but they will have to check you out and check you back in. So that way, um, you know, you're not uh, what they call a tenant because a tenant, you know, becomes technically a tenant after 30 days, they have different protections. Like trying to kick you out is harder if you've stayed there at least 30 days already, okay? Than if you were just staying there for a couple of days, okay? Um, you know, so it talks about mold and, you know, and different things, okay? So again, a lot of more disclosure. So just kind of review it. And if you have questions how to complete it, just let me know, um, okay? But again, I never say, you know, um, you know, offer free rent. I always say, hey, waive, agree to waive the rental fee if they move out by a certain time, just like we did on that other form, okay? All right, so let me take a quick look at the chat. Um, okay, so Shazia, um, you have a question you that you wanna ask now? Is it about the form or is it something else? It's something else. Okay, you wanna ask it? Sure. Are we still alive? Uh, you're still, we're still live. Uh, oh. <laughs> if you want to ask it after, I can call you. Oh, but, uh, yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. So just reach out. All right. Um, so we're still on YouTube, right? So you got to ask a question. Just know that you're, this is being recorded. So that way there's other agents who can benefit from it. So now, again, doing the rent back, right? This has been happening. It's going to happen more often, right? Because some sellers don't have don't have a place to move to next yet, right? Um, although I would say more than half the deals out there right now, homes are vacant. Okay, so if you look at all the listings out there, about half of them are vacant. So which means that we don't really have to deal with rent backs. Okay, um, usually if I have a seller that we're selling a house to buy another house, I always have a plan B for them. Meaning, hey, if if somehow the next house is not ready, is there you guys have a place to go to? or what is your transition plan, okay? Um, some of them, I've helped them move into a hotel before, but usually they have family members they can move into, um, or I've been able to just, you know, do the SIP or the RLAS and then transition them into a, to their new house so that way they don't have to move more than once, right? Because, <laughs> because again, our job as agents is to make the process uh, seamless for them, okay? Um, you know, as easy as possible. But sometimes, you know, there are unavoidable things that happen during the transaction. Just know 
this rent back form is very critical. So know which one to use, 29 days or less, SIP, the simple form, right? Um, 30 days or more, you have to use the RLAS, okay? So again, um, just ask your office, um, your, you know, your, your transaction manager for any questions, okay? Um, okay, so let's open it up. Any specific questions you guys have that you wanna ask? Who wants to go first? Yes, Greg, I have a question. Yeah? Uh, can I have those copies of this, what you showed me, just a SIP and the RLS form, okay. filled up form? Okay, I'll send you um, a sample of it. But basically, you know, uh, if you look at this, right, right, um, on the end, right, seller must give minimum yeah. seven-day notice, right, prior to moving out, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, of course, um, if you look at my other form, right, the SIP, right, we created this in our uh, template class, um, you know, seller to maintain their current current homeowner insurance policy, because the contract calls for the the seller, the tenant, to get a renter's insurance. What I usually tell my seller is just keep your homeowner's policy in place. You know, most of them have already paid it for the year, so there's no extra cost, and then we cancel it once they move out, because that offers them more protection for their personal belongings than a regular renter's policy. Okay. Now the buyer will have insurance already uh, because that's a requirement for their loan. So in a way there's kind of like double insurance, but still it gives a benefit to my, to my seller to have their own homeowner's policy um, that they had in place before. So just in case, you know, they hire a mover and that person gets hurt, at least they have extra coverage for liability insurance, okay? Um, so again, this language here is here, okay? Um, you know, I'll send this over to Syed. And again, uh, next week, we'll talk more about this, about uh, the forms. So hang in there. But again, if you want to you know, watch what I put in here, you know, just look at the YouTube channel later on today. Otherwise, you know, uh, just reach out to me. Text me to remind me. Okay, Syed? Yeah, okay. okay. And okay. I have okay. one more yes. question here, Greg. Yes. This is it. Question? Uh, uh, in, on purchase contract, page yes. number three. Okay. Purchase contract, page number three. What's the question? Yeah, question is uh, here it says uh, uh, P19. If we are asking a refrigerator, washer, dryer, everything, we have to mark here, right? If we yes. are asking the seller. Correct. Yep. Um, so, what Sayed is mm -hmm. talking about is on page three of the contract, right? So, let's bring that up. Okay. Right here. So, if yeah. the buyer wants the washer, dryer, and refrigerator, you have to check it here, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then what you have to do is, do you want to have it covered in your in your home warranty, right? So make sure you put here on the home warranty plan, make sure you put the right dollar amount, right? Mm -hmm. And you put here, you know, uh, usually it's the comprehensive plan, right? That's what we have, right? Or what we call upgraded plan, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, refrigerator, right? Coverage, right? If you want, you know, washer, dryer and all that, you can add that. Sometimes you have to uh, lessen the letters, right? Okay. But that's what you could do. Okay. Uh, something like that. Okay. Um, just make sure the dollar amount is there. Again, if you don't have enough room here, you can put it in other terms or you can make, um, you know, if you keep typing up here, it'll create a text overflow form. Okay. Um, so any other questions, Ayan? Yes, sir. There's another question, a technical question, the same, the same thing. If I don't try to wash a dryer, is on this form, but if they write on the disclosures, uh, washer, dryer, refrigerator is included, how does it work? Okay. But if All I right. forget, it's not gonna happen. But. Okay, so everything here must be checked, right? So let's say mm -hmm. Syed did not check refrigerator, washer, dryer, right? Mm -hmm. The house has a washer, dryer, and refrigerator. On the MLS, it says there, the seller will leave the washer and dryer, right? Yes. So what happens, right? Um, well, technically, the washer and dryer are not included, okay? Because if you look at item nine of the contract, right? Um, items included and excluded, Syed says here. Yes. Notice to buyer and seller. Items okay. listed as included or excluded in the MLS, right? Multiple listing service. Flyers, marking materials, or disclosures are not included 
in the purchase price or excluded from the sale unless specified in this paragraph. So unless you put something on that on number nine, right? On letter P, right? Um, the, con the washer dryer is not included technically. Now some sellers, you know, they don't want it. So they'll leave it <laughs> even though you didn't check it. Okay. So again, the contract is the contract. Everything else is for marketing purposes. Now, if Sayed put here, right, uh, items included, you could have put like, let's say, oops, let me just, uh, okay. uh, you, let's say you put here per MLS, right? Right. Then, you know, you may have, you know, good grounds to, you know, they said it on the MLS, so you put per MLS, right? So that's something that you could do, okay? But again, you know, if it's not something that um, you know is noted on on letter P, yeah, right, item nine, then it's not technically included. All right. So, yeah, make sure you do it properly. All right. But like I said, sometimes the seller will leave it anyways, and you get lucky. <laughs> they, they take <laughs> Thank it. You, Thank you. They take it. And your buyer may say, "Hey, Syed, where's my washer dryer?" Right. <laughs> <laughs> you may have to buy them a new one. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Remember, the contract is a contract, right? It's a guide until there's an issue. If there's no issues, it doesn't matter what we put in the contract, right? Okay. Trisha, question? Uh, so question about um, this disclosure that I had a listing agent ask me to sign last week. It's a disclaimer and a waiver of rights with regards to all of the details in the MLS. And I refuse to sign it, refuse to have my buyer sign it. Yeah. But have you ever had a situation like that where they delayed the close of escrow or didn't agree with your, you know, refusal? refusal? Um, I'm not sure what form you're speaking of. So you can send it to me. Okay. So I can look no, at it. But a, if let's say they, they have, okay. There are mandatory disclosures per the contract, right? Right. Uh -huh. For instance, uh, we have a document retention form, right? The internal re document retention form, right? that we tell our clients that, hey, you know, uh, we hold the, we, we, we hold the, uh, the files uh, online, right? Now, some of our forms like that, we ask the other side to sign, just to acknowledge it, right? Sometimes they will not want to sign it because whatever the reason is, right? Technically, it's not a contractual requirement. So they can't say, hey, if you don't sign this disclaimer, we're not going to close escrow. They can't do that. Okay. Okay. They, they can't. Okay. That's not a contractual duty. Just like I have some brokers, right? That, that I say, hey, can you uh, just complete the uh, the SPQ, right? Before it was an auto, it was not an automatic check on the contract. Like for instance, we have like um, some disclosure. For instance, there's the East Bay disclosure form, right? Um, some agents will not sign it unless you specifically put it on the contract. Okay. Some agents, like myself, I do it anyways because it's, um, you know, it's something that's customary and it's no big deal. But yeah, but if you're giving up rights or the your clients are giving up specific rights, you know, that's why I said, you know, send me the form. I'd like to look at it. Yeah. Some agents will try to create this, you know, uh, CYA type of form that, you know, hey, you know, I'm not responsible for anything <laughs> that my seller discloses, you know, a uh, buyer is responsible for, you know, all of this stuff, right? Yeah. Be careful uh -oh. when we have your clients yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much what it was. Yeah. It was a yeah. brokerage, you know, yeah. small brokerage out in the valley that um, yeah. just wanted yeah. you to wave everything. So, yeah. question so about if you the find FIP. it, send it to me, okay? Maybe we'll start okay. using it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it waved everything. It was crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. question about the SIP and the deposit. Um, right. Let's assume it's it's held in escrow. I had this happen recently. Um, we didn't stipulate how that deposit would be returned from escrow. Escrow just took it upon themselves to write a check. And then okay. I kind of had to get involved to, you know, decide whether they wanted to have it wired because they had already moved to Rockland. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but is mm -hmm. that something that you would suggest writing into that SIP somewhere, you know, okay. the, the SIP, form of the return? Yeah, the SIP doesn't really go to anywhere besides the two agents, right? And also, of course, the buyer and seller, right? Okay. Oh, because we send it to escrow since it had the deposit. Yeah. Okay. You could. Okay. So, so they see it, but yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes escrow uh, will do something without even consulting the agents or the clients. Okay. 
yeah, we just have to be on top of it because sometimes they take it upon themselves to send it out, right? I, and you don't want it sent out, okay? Because remember, escrow is supposed to be a neutral third party, right? They don't do anything unless they get both sides to agree on that instruction, right? Um, yeah, and I usually handle it with just an email from the yeah from the other agent to release the deposit mm -hmm. you know send that to escrow yeah. and then we're done right i mean there's nothing else that we have to do after that i'm assuming yeah, that basically. escrow follows through with the release of the deposit yeah but sometimes they don't send it out right or they they uh you know like the calculations sometimes it's off so make sure that you're sending the right money right and that's where you got to make sure your your numbers are correct like because sometimes people say when does my rent back start if we close escrow today is today day zero or day one, right? If we close today, whatever timeline is, everything starts on day zero. So if we close today, today's day zero, tomorrow's day one, right? That's why if a seller does moves out by the end of business today, there's no rent, right? But the moment they stay overnight, they pay rent, just like you have in a hotel, right? So to speak. So again, Everything starts on day zero. You always start on counting on day zero, which is today, okay? Or whatever that timeline is, okay? So, because some people always forget, you know, is this today day one or day zero, right? So make sure you do that. All right. So, then question. Yes, I am. Uh, what about 30 days? When they start, assume that today I went to the, into a contract and the seller has signed today. So yeah. the day one is going to today or tomorrow? Tomorrow, right? Because the sell this day is when the seller accepted your offer. Yes. Today's day zero. Okay. You may have gotten a verbal yesterday, but until <laughs> the seller signs it, that would be day zero. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. So remember, you have to follow the contract. Now, if they post date or they backdate it, right? Like to yesterday, they're not supposed to do that. Okay. Um, because with, with technology these days, they can do e-signing on their phone. So you know, there's no reason why they couldn't have signed it yesterday, right? But sometimes they'll say, oh, we'll, we'll accept it tomorrow. Careful, because another offer could come in, right? We talked about that yesterday. Um, yeah, so get everything signed as soon as possible, all right? So remember, everything starts on day zero, right? Okay, good. Okay, right? thank so you. So there's always a day zero, then, you know, then you start counting. And remember, if the deadline is on a weekend, right? or a holiday, it goes to the next business day, right? So if 30 days is Saturday, you know, the deadline is technically there. Now, if 50, if 30, if let's say 15 day rent back and the rent back falls on a, on a Saturday, do they have until Monday? I don't know. No, <laughs> it's not a deadline. <laughs> it's a contractual obligation to move out. So if 15 days is Saturday, they have to move out by the end of Saturday, okay? So th that that one does not roll over to the next next um, business day, okay? Only uh, contractual obligations, <laughs> only close of escrow, only yeah. continuous yeah. removal, which we'll learn on Thursday, falls onto the next business day if the deadline is on the weekend or holiday, okay? So, um, so if those deadlines happen on Saturday or Sunday or holiday, it goes to the next business day. So know your holidays, right? What's the next holiday coming up? Don't say Memorial Mother's Day. Day. Huh? What is it? Memorial Day. Memorial Day? What day is Memorial Day? May 30th. Okay, what day is that? Monday. Monday, right? So if a deadline falls on that Saturday, where does it go to? Tuesday. 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 All right? Because Monday is a holiday, right? So again, know what you, what you, you know, so if you're supposed to close on a Saturday, you can't, you have to close until Sunday. So some people may have to wait three days, right? So again, this is where you have to know the calendar, right? So whenever I, you know, um, you know, especially sending counters, I look at where the dates are. I usually try to close Tuesday or Wednesday. That's my preferred date to close the escrow, right? We signed the week before we closed like Tuesday, Wednesday, in case there's a, you know, because holidays are usually on a, on a Monday, Okay, that, that's, that seems to be the case, right? Except, you know, of course, Thanksgiving, right? That's always on a Thursday. But most of the time, it's on Mondays, okay? So I usually try to close by, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday. Then my clients will move out during the weekend before. That's just a planning thing. That doesn't always happen, right? So any more questions on how to complete the SIP, the residential lease after sale agreement, okay? 
or dealing with rent backs. Yeah, what happens if a seller stays out? All right. She got one question. Oh. Yeah. Stop bothering Sayad. All right. So I, I, she has one question. All right. Okay. Kim, Kim yeah, has some question. Good, Kim. Question. No, I, I don't have a question. I'm gonna give you a real 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 time story. So I have okay. a property in, in Livermore. Mm -hmm. The agent, uh, it is very important to know all these documents, uh, how, to, how to prepare properly and, and the dates are correct, this and that. Uh, I had to basically send uh, that R, um, RLAS three times back because dates were incorrect. Mm -hmm. And last night, um, I got an email from the TC that if it's uh, incorrect, why don't you do it? <laughs> I said, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. You have to correct it and send it to me, correct one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make my seller sign. So it's yeah. very, very important to make sure that all the dates, the correct dates are at the correct, um, correct. you know, column. Okay, great. Yeah. Remember, you know, real estate is all about what's in writing, right? So as Kim says, well, everything has, with the RLAS, the dates are more critical on the SIP. Like I said, it's just, you know, it's a rolling calendar, right? It's number of days after close of escrow. I'm not sure why they didn't do that for the RLAS, but because it's a, it's a lease agreement, they're asked why there has to be a specific date. Okay, so make sure you know how to fill out both forms. Okay, and you know which one applies when, right? Thank you, um, Kim, for that story. Just understand, there's a lot that, you know, will happen. And here's the thing, right? Whose job is it to create the, uh, the, the forms, the SIP or RLAS form? Is it the listing agent or buyer's agent? <laughs> Who's no, supposed I to fill it out? Yes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> The buyer's agent is the one that's supposed to fill it out, right? If you're the buyer's agent, you should fill it out because no. it dictates the terms of how you want the lease or the rent back to be, how much the daily rent is, how much the security deposit is, okay? Because some sellers don't want to do all that. They don't want to pay security deposits, you know, and say, well, what, what's that for, right? Again, if you put that as part of your offer, that'll be the best time to deal with it, Okay. Because if you try to do it during the escrow period, the seller may not or is not required to agree to your terms. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's why it's usually best to do it at the time you submit the offer. Okay, All right. So the biggest thing with rent backs is number one is the rental fee, right? Number two is the security deposit, and number three, what happens if they stay over? Those have to be planned out on your on your forms. Okay. Usually I double the rent after the 15 days, 30 days, whatever days that they were supposed to stay, the rent doubles, okay? I have that on my form. And again, you know, if I submit that with my offer, my offer may not get accepted or at least the listing agent will have questions about it. You just have to explain to them why that is, okay? Um, again, you need to have the form filled out properly in case you have to sue the seller or staying over or doing something to the house later, right? Because if you just say, you know, on your contract, um, you know, seller, you know, buyer agrees to give seller, you know, free, you know, free 45 day rent back. What does that mean was free? So if they stay on the 46th day, how much are they going to be charged an extra day? There's no number to go by, right? So that's why it's important to have those handled in the beginning. So that way, at very worst case, you have a daily rate. And then of course, better is you have a penalty if they stay over, right? So usually, you know, on my forms, like I said, if seller moves out within those many days, buyer agrees to waive the rent back fee. So that way they, it gives them incentive to move out before or at least on time, right? But of course, our jobs is to make the deal happen, right? So sometimes this could become a stickler for negotiations. Just understand, know how to protect your buyer and seller because it depends on whose side you're on, right? Because if I'm writing an offer on Kim's listing, she could be, uh, you know, a, she's a great negotiator. So <laughs> I look forward to that day because, yeah, I look forward to when, you, when I negotiate across the tables with some of you guys because, you know, it's fun negotiating. That to me, that's the fun part of the business is what you can get away with, so to speak, right? Or how to protect your clients better. Just know. There will be agents out there who will try to take advantage of you, <laughs> okay? Uh, so know the contracts, okay? And always check back with us in case there's some, uh, you know, some things to clarify. Kim? Um, I also had another um, thing I wanted to share. Uh, we uh -huh. had one of the agents over here in Pleasanton office uh, 
the release the, the money to the buyer and seller was very difficult. So mm-hmm. always, always keep deposit and rent to be held in escrow. Yep. You do not want to release it. Uh, yeah. After that, you'll be in trouble and it's just a big mess. Yep. Yeah. Try to collect from someone who doesn't want to pay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So all the rents, even though it's going to be free if they stay over, right? Always have it in escrow, right? Uh, and again, explain to the listing agent why that is. Okay, it's the seller's money if they move out on time. If they don't move out, at least, you know, the buyer does not automatically get the money, okay? There has to be a release from the other side too, okay? So, because remember, escrow doesn't do anything unless there's an agreement between both sides, okay? So make sure the escrow knows that, okay? Because as we said earlier, you know, I think Trisha brought it up, sometimes escrow will do something without getting your approval, right? And sometimes it goes wrong, okay? But then they will be liable for that because they're supposed to get, um, you know, terms from both parties. Okay, so they can't just say, "Oh, that's what we had on the form." No, that's why you need to make sure paper trail uh, is properly done. Okay, so anything else to question, questions, comments to share about rent backs? Any horror stories? Anybody? Okay. Uh, no? There was another. There was one more situation. Another Sorry. one. Okay. There was a deposit in escrow we were saved, but after seller moved out, they removed the door ring bell. And now buyer wants that ring bell. <laughs> seller took it with them. Yeah. So what do what do we do? So you well, know, I, I got it done and sent a bill in escrow and it was taken care of. And yeah. then we yeah, you can the ask the seller to bring it back, but sometimes you know they'll just say, oh, you know, just deduct it from my security deposit. That's why you have a security deposit. You never know sometimes, you know, there's things missing from the house. Right or damage Greg, to the house. Greg, a ring bell we can write on the form just purchase contract. Remember that one? Yeah. Page number three. On page number three, on the yeah, personal items, right? Down, you yeah. can put there. You know, those a are smart. Bell, yeah. Those are what we call the smart home device, right? Yes. So yeah. if you check that box and if you read number nine of the contract, it tells you exactly what are the smart home devices. Ring door, ring doorbells. That, that's one of the biggest things. The Nest temperature gauge thing, right? Yes. Sometimes it's Alexa, you know, those, those uh, Amazon stuff at home, right? Um, yeah, there are those, those are smart home devices. So if you look at the contract, right? Um, okay, so let me pull that up, right? So if you look at on number, on page three, as Sayed was saying, right? Right here, right? It says here, smart home control devices. What is that? So if Syed checks that, right? Okay. Yeah. As a listing agent, yeah. you better know what number nine yeah. says, right? You know, what what is, you know, what is a, uh, you know, security system home automation, right? You need to read number nine totally. This is one of the number one places that people get sued on, right? Or, um, or things that, you know, people have a misunderstanding, okay? Besides non-disclosure or fraud, this is where lawsuits happen. And this is one of the reasons why this is, um, you know, this contract has expanded to 16 pages because of things like this, because these have been lawsuits, right? So make sure you guys understand item nine, not just, you know, uh, this part, right? Not just this part here, uh, where is that? On P1, right? Not just here, right? Not just this P1 here, you need to know item number nine, which says here item nine. You need to go down to item nine and actually understand what is included or excluded. Just like when Sayed asked the question, hey, if I forget to check washer, dryer, and refrigerator on the contract, but it's on the MLS, is it included? No, it's not technically, because as it says here on 9A, it has to be on the form, on this form, to be included or excluded, okay? Um, so, um, you know, on the links I sent you guys this morning and the past, you know, there's a training video on the how to read the contract. So hopefully you guys have read that. Okay. And we'll go into some detail, you know, next week, but we're not going to read this word for word. Okay. I'm going to expect you guys to actually read it yourself and then come back with questions just like Sayed and everybody else. Right. So <clears throat> any Wait, other Trisha, questions? Trisha, I have an unrelated question. Yes, Trisha. So I've got a listing coming up. The homeowners have lived in the property just going on two years. When they purchased it, there was a whole house water softener system. The seller 
took it with them. So when they purchased the home, it had the water softener had been removed and by the close of escrow no longer existed. Do we need to disclose that somewhere now in this transaction now that they're selling? Um, I would probably disclose it that the previous seller had a water softener system that they took. I mean, it doesn't hurt, right? So there was nowhere in the TDS SPQ to put that. And I'm sitting here just thinking about it because I got to do my AVID soon. Yeah. Would I just you, put it in there and then just- Yeah, the you can put your AVID on the others, right? Um, you know, so you can do that. Um, yeah, there is no place for that on the TDS or SPQ. Yeah, because I have requirement, right? writing because, in that, you know, some repairs or whatever had been, may or may not have been done without, yeah. with or without permits. So right. that's where I was thinking I would put it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So the more disclosures we make, the better it is for us because there will be easier for us to get out of uh, issues later on. Okay. So in closing regarding rent back, make sure you guys address the rent, security deposit, and the penalties, right, uh, for staying over. Those three things are, you know, are things that you guys need to address um, for the contract itself, okay? So let's close it up on, on the SIP before we open, just open up to other questions. So anything, any other questions on the rent back? All right, so let me hit the stop.